So um, again, hello everyone. Welcome to the webinar on the SCOS's future. My name is Agata Morka. I am SCOS coordinator, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today for an hour and a half, uh, during which we will discuss the future of SCOS and what it is that we have planned for the next uh, for the next three years, at least three years. So um, I will give you a little bit of an overview of how we planned the session today. So at first, um, we will do a round of introductions so that you know who will be speaking during the session. Then we will have a panel discussion combined with presentations. And then we will turn to you, to the audience. Um, it will be your time to ask questions to our panelists. And at the end, uh, I will tell you a little bit more about next steps and also about the third round um, and the third pledging round of SCOS, which is now open. Um, so without further ado, I think, uh, let me uh, welcome our panelists, panelists for today. So first of all, uh, we have Martin Borchardt, who is university librarian from the University of New South Wales. Martin is the chair of the SCOS board. Welcome, Martin. Very nice Hello. to have you here. Hello. Thank you. Hi, everybody. OK, next I have Vanessa Proudman. Vanessa is director of Spark Europe, and she is also executive, um, SCOS executive group chair. Welcome, Vanessa. Uh, also, just to let everybody know, Vanessa will be leaving 15 minutes earlier uh, as today, so apologies for that. Next, we have Al-Walid al, al who's Senior Intellectual Property Librarian at the Qatar National Library. And Al-Walid is one of the SCOS board members. Welcome, Al-Walid. Hello. Hello, everyone. Next, we have um, a representative of France on our board. So hello, uh, Jean-Francois Lutz from Université de Lorraine, also one of the SCOS board members. Welcome, Jean-Francois. Hello, hi, everybody. And last but not least, a person who was absolutely instrumental for um, putting this strategy together is John Treadway, consultant from Great North Wood Consulting. Hello, John. Hi, everybody. Nice. OK, I think that um, we have everyone, everyone here with us. Um, so Al-Walid, uh, now over to you for the panel discussion um, and uh, for the presentation of the SCOS strategy. Thanks, Agatha. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. And welcome to our session on the st uh, SCOS strategy. And before we talk about you know, the strategy and what we're doing in the, in the future, perhaps we can uh, step back and talk about where we are right now. So um, I do have a first question. And I'm going to be asking the, the panelists some questions as we go along. Um, the first question is, you know, since so since 2017, SCOS has been active. So I was wondering if the panelists can tell us more about SCOS, what we do, and what we have achieved in the past couple of years. Could I maybe start and uh, take us back uh, to the beginning? Um, so I was I was uh, looking at, at my records, and we actually started talking about SCOS um, late 2016 in a, in a very small room at uh, Schiphol Airport. Um, and we have members um, from Science Europe, the European University Association, Liber, Eiffel, Call, um, Knowledge Exchange. Um, and we all came together because um, although a lot of open science policy making was under discussion and also the, uh, the costs of open access publishing, there was very little uh, talk about um, funding um, open science infrastructure. And um, we were also very inspired by uh, Cameron Nealon um, and his colleagues um, work uh, on the principles for open scholarly infrastructures. And I think uh, many of us since then have, have heard that quote, um, everything we've gained by opening content and data will be under threat if we allow the enclosure of scholarly infrastructures. And that's why we came together and um, to, uh, to firstly see whether we were aligned, whether we all saw 
the challenge that um, many infrastructures that we depend upon, not-for-profit ones, um, uh, their operations were um, not always secure, so operational funding, they had development funding, but not operational funding. There was a growing number of them. Um, and we also thought that um, we probably needed um, a committee to form a consolidated voice to uh, reach out to the library co community, to researchers, to funders, to see how we can collaboratively um, uh, share the costs of uh, the operations of really important open science infrastructure. So, uh, so we came together um, in late 2016. And as you know, things take time to get going. And in 2017, we established the group um, and we have a number of members um, since then. Um, and I think uh, uh, we now have, um, uh, we're promoting eight infrastructures and we've helped raise 3.3 million euros. So we're really pleased um, a few years um, uh, moving forward from that meeting um, <clears throat> that um, uh, infrastructures are now really um, being addressed by libraries and um, uh, funded going forward. Thanks, Vanessa. Um, thank you for the answer. And perhaps I can uh, ask Martin a question. Um, now, I, I was wondering if you can tell us more about the governance at SCOS. How, what is the government's uh, structure and uh, who is involved in running SCOS? Thanks. Um, so we've had the governance structure running almost from the beginning. Um, it was one of the priorities uh, for Spark Europe and for SCOS. Um, because we know that it's not just about the money. So we know also that good governance is highly important uh, to the community. Um, so quite early on, very beginning of 2017, um, we set up the SCOS executive, um, which is like the know Vanessa, um, and also like the Agatha is also helping with that, um, which runs the everyday business um, and the operations of SCOS. So, you know, that's things like the calls. Um, it also does the communications, for example. Um, but we also set up a board very, very quickly. Um, we really wanted to have global representation on the board. So um, we wanted each of the continents represented also as much as possible as we could. Um, and um, we set up a yeah. board. And we looked for people to be members of the board um, I mean, who could represent. Um, so we've actually got um, also like a good representation uh, from most of the world. Um, you can look on our website. We've got representation uh, from Europe. Um, also, we've got representation uh, from Canada um, and also the USA and from Australia and New Zealand, which is me representing. We've also got representation from Africa um, and also I don't know, from South America, we did have for quite a while as well. Um, we were very careful to try uh, to choose people um, who, who we thought were experts, um, which were chosen by the groups that they're representing as well because of their expertise, also to build a trusted network. Um, and it's important. And then there's a third level uh, as well of governance. Um, which is uh, the advisory group, uh, led, which is led by my colleague Fiona Bradley, also from UNSW. That group's role um, is uh, to assess uh, the expressions of interest uh, that come in from infrastructure. Um, we've developed a program there. Um, we have assessment criteria. Um, they also, um, look um, um, also at the longer applications as the second stage as well um, and they provide us uh, some advice to the board as well. Um, we meet on a regular basis with the board, um, we always have agendas and papers um, and we try really hard uh, to govern as best as we can. Thanks, Martin. And indeed, the SCOS board and advisory group are quite uh, diverse and representative of different uh, countries worldwide. I have the privilege you know, of being on the board and representing kind of the region here also. Um, I was lucky to be part of this uh, strategy working group this year. So um, coming to the topic of the day, um, 
so at the beginning of the year, SCOS uh, set up a strategy working group and, um, and maybe um, Vanessa and Martin, maybe you can tell us why um, a strategy working group was set up this year and what was uh, our goals um, or what we wanted to achieve. Sure, so I might go first. Um, so when we started SCOS, we wanted to really get started you know, sort of straight away um, uh, um, and to start you. making a difference. Yeah, we, wanted to start, we wanted her to start making a difference. So we ran the pilot very, very quickly, um, which was a successful pilot. Uh, and we were able uh, to support some infrastructure very quickly and obtain funding for DOJ, AJ, and like the know for Sherpa Romeo um, as well. But at this stage, this year, um, we were already entering um, into the third round in a way. So we wanted to take some time um, to do some more thinking. So um, as opposed to the start, you know, which was a quick start, we thought we had some time to really uh, want to investigate uh, what the community is thinking. Um, we wanted to investigate uh, what their response is to SCOS ask what the priorities are, what's important, and to help to frame the strategy going forward. We wanted to have, yeah, you know, we wanted the strategy to be based on evidence. Um, so um, we wanted uh, to do a consultation process and then use that data to frame the strategy. Um, we really wanted the strategy to advise us how we were going to proceed either the same way or make differences um, as we go into round four. Thank you, Martin. Uh, which brings me now to the, the, the consultation itself. <clears throat> so Martin, you've mentioned that, you know, our approach was to have an evidence-based uh, kind of approach to have a strategy based on feedback. Um, John, maybe if you can uh, tell us more about this approach, um, and you can tell us more about the work um, that was done in more detail and kind of the, the feedback that we got back from the community. Sure, it would be my pleasure, uh, our lead. So, um, you know, uh, the, the process was one which, and looking through the attendees, I think some of the people who've been able to join us today were involved. We began by um, undertaking a survey of different stakeholders across the research sector, trying to keep it manageable, but with specific sections targeted at potential uh, recipients of SCOS funding, providers of open infrastructure, and also institutions that have pledged funds through SCOS in the past. So two core groups that are obviously of interest, but then also general questions aimed more widely. We were delighted that we were able to get over 200 responses to that survey. Um, and then we supplemented that by uh, six focus groups with over 30 attendees and um, over 20 interviews one-to-one -one with a range of different individuals, people who'd responded and had particular uh, backgrounds or opinions, you know, those who are actively supportive of SCOS, people who'd been successful in seeking funding, people who'd been unsuccessful, trying to make sure we had in different ways considered the views of as wide a group of people as possible. You know, SCOS being a network, SCOS being active in the community, very, very much predicated on its ability to create connections between entities that didn't exist otherwise. It was obviously a really important thing for us to be doing. So um, that was what we did. Um, and I'm very happy to talk through some of the results. Um, Agatha, if you wouldn't mind uh, moving on to the next slide. So um, you can see here that this is a breakdown of those respondents. There were over 200 respondents. Um, Canada provided the highest number of respondents from any single country at 18 and France the next highest at 14. Um, and that's why you see uh, a large number from North America there, but you also see an even larger number from Europe because the long tail of European countries providing a few respondents each added up quite rapidly. We received a lot of respondents from Qatar, from Australia, from the USA. And when I say respondents, I mean that the um, respondent was based at an institution or, or working in those countries. Um, in terms of the types of organization responding, the majority were from university libraries, over 50%, um, and a number of other 
uh, libraries were well represented there. We had a number of people responding from research, research intensive universities, other roles within research intensive universities, and a, and a significant minority, about 40% of respondents, had authority over budgets or authority to, to spend money supporting infrastructure. They had the ability to decide to support uh, infrastructure through their budgets. And around 13, respond, around 13 of the respondents were representing organisations that had previously applied to SCOS for funding, and 44 were from organisations that had pledged funding to uh, at least one SCOS initiative in the past. If you wouldn't mind going ahead to the slide. Um, so the, I'm going to summarise the results. Um, it's fair to say, you know, we the responses represented the areas in which SCOS has been able to um, engage more organisations in which it's been able to find successfully organisations willing to pledge funds. The breakdown of countries that I was describing well represented in the um, the organisation supporting SCOS and we saw we asked people about their awareness and saw a, a not too unsurprising cascade you know nearly 90 percent of people were somewhat very or extremely familiar with open science infrastructure in general and then around 65 percent were familiar with SCOS itself in some sense and then just under 50 percent said they were somewhat very or extremely familiar with the SCOS operating model. Those in Europe or North America were more likely to be extremely or very familiar with open science infrastructure or SCOS. Um, and those from responding from institutions that pledge funds to SCOS or pledge funds to SCOS initiatives were also more likely to be extremely familiar or very familiar than the more general respondents that we were receiving. About 76% of respondents thought that SCOS is currently important as a source of funding to open science infrastructure. You can see that at the bottom there. And that was replicated very broadly, very well replicated in different regions and different types of respondents. Um, and then around 60% in total thought that SCOS was either somewhat very or extremely effective in the provision of its support to open science infrastructure. And this is an area which we ask people to explore in more detail, both through the survey in particular at um, focus groups and in other areas. Um, so when people were asked why they thought SCOS was effective, they expressed that they felt it had increased awareness, it had drawn more organisations into providing support for open science infrastructure than had previously done so. People expressed that they had seen more funding being channeled to initiatives and that they'd seen the, the organisations that were providing funding were now providing more funding. So an increase in funding, you know, the average amount of support provided. The visibility of open science infrastructure was highlighted as something that SCOS has been able to uh, raise. And also the interoperability between open science infrastructure which was mentioned perhaps a surprising amount to me that that was something people picked up on specifically that by raising awareness and by promoting infrastructure globally SCOS had been causing people to think more actively about the interoperability of different infrastructures and services. Um, when they were saying why they hadn't been more positive about the impact SCOS had had um, people talked about um, that the support for open science infrastructure is still, still seen as a nice to have. It's, it's, it's a good thing, but it's not essential. And therefore the line in institutional budgets is vulnerable when there is pressure on expenditure. Um, respondents highlighted that they perceived a, a, a geographic imbalance. So, you know, while support's coming from some particular geographies, that there were countries that weren't pulling their weight in terms of the amount of funding available within research institutions that could be deployed in supporting infrastructure and that again that that issue that some institutions were benefiting from open science infrastructure but not yet contributing to um, the maintenance or providing funding to open science infrastructure and and, and so uh, that there was more to do and that was reasons people said why they expressed a negative or, or why they weren't saying something was extremely or very uh, effective uh, rather than somewhat. Uh, Agatha, if you wouldn't mind jumping onto the next slide. Um, uh, organisations pledging support. Um, we asked those organisations who had previously provided support to um, a SCOS initiative uh, to uh, 
whether SCOS was needed to connect their organizations, whether it still had value as an intermediary. And lots of them said, yes, it did. But a large proportion said that they weren't sure, they didn't know. And that's something that we talked a lot to them about in um, focus groups and specific one-to-one -one conversations to try and understand that in more detail. Um, when we asked why they had chosen to provide support to particular infrastructures, the explanations were obviously often that uh, the infrastructure in question was one that they actively used, one that they knew there was awareness of within the institution. So when it was highlighted that that infrastructure needed support, they were able to leverage that awareness to, to persuade people to provide support. Um, the, the signal of national consortia involvement in Canada or Finland or Norway, these were particular ones highlighted, was um, a signal to them that this was valuable. Uh, availability of funds was particularly flagged you know so people said well if we had some money we were very keen to provide support um and and also people said they hadn't previously provided support um that the strength of case made by the infrastructures in question was extremely good and and just the the obvious uniqueness or importance of the entity providing the services in question was obvious to them um i I'm aware that I've got a couple more slides and I want to go through uh, some other significant points. So uh, I'll try and be brief here. Future need for SCOS, um, that's a duplicate slide. I apologize. apologize. We've got the same slide in twice somehow. So that's the one we just showed. So if you could move on to the next one, Agatha. Um, so this is about priorities for funding. So we asked what type of service would respondents prioritize? And um, the, this is the aggregate perspective and open publishing services, tools and platforms was way ahead, the most common response from respondents. But there were um, three areas identified which were over 40%. So uh, open access repository services providing uh, fair, making uh, data fair, fair data available, apologies, and open research data infrastructure and services more broadly. And then there were another four responses that received over 25 percent responses you can see in there interoperability and information exchange services open citation services those that maintain metadata services uh, standards and discovery services and indexes and and those are that pattern was broadly mirrored globally broadly mirrored by different um types of institutions responding and we we were encouraged to see that only two percent of respondents uh, offered uh, came up with something that wasn't covered by the list of options. This is a, a list that's actively used by SCOS when thinking about applicants and where to prioritise funding. And so um, it was it was positive that people felt they were able to represent their views according to that list. And then the, the final thing I wanted to highlight was the, the criteria for funding. So uh, we asked respondents um, what they would use to prioritize which open service science infrastructure initiatives to support. And uh, three, three responses came out um, significantly higher than anything else chosen by over 40% of um, respondents. Uh, some of them you can see there nearly up to 60%. So interoperability, the involvement of the community in the governance and the global significance of the infrastructure in question were comfortably and clearly ahead of the uh, other responses, although there were well, there's a second shelf, a second tier there of responses that come in over 25% as well, which is organizational resilience, the urgency of need for funding, and the innovation of the solution being offered. And, and I offer a consideration here. This this again was well represented globally. This this sort of pattern, these these were the most common responses globally and according to the most uh, according to different types of respondent but the first three there are very much about the way in which the organization looks outwardly the way in which it relates to other stakeholders in the sector and how significant it is to people across the globe rather than just locally the next three are very much around the organization's own internal stability its uh, ability and, and and the value of the solution in its novelty so those are things that have been uh, widely discussed within SCOS and, and, and will influence the funding decisions to come and uh, that we picked up quite extensively again in, in some of the focus groups and the one-to-one -one discussions that we had. So hopefully that's, uh, um, our lead Agatha, hopefully that's, that's covered in not too long a time some of the major findings that we had from the survey and, and the uh, 
Uh, thank you, John. That was great. Uh, very comprehensive. And, um, and it's great, you know, as, as costs, we are global, we are community led. And so it's really great to see the feedback from very, quite diverse uh, entities and locations. And it's really good to uh, understand what the community thinks the SCOS role should be and what the priorities are going forward. So I have a question right now for Agatha. And, uh, and one of the goals of the strategy working groups is to define what the mission and vision of SCOS uh, will be. So as mission, what, we'll be, what we do and the vision, how do we envision the future or the world to be? Um, and I was wondering if you can tell us, um, talk to us through this mission uh, or those mission and vision statements. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Awali. I will use some slides to help myself here. Uh, so, um, of course, as you can um, you can imagine at, at this point, um, the whole strategy was based on the dialogue with the community. So everything that uh, we gathered from the consultation that John has been just uh, talking about, uh, that all fed into the final document and the final strategy. And uh, one of the most important things for us was uh, to define our mission and to define our vision. So there was quite a lot of discussion going on in our group, going back and forth as to how we want to um, accumulate our mission in one sentence and how to do the same with the vision. So uh, here is the outcome of these, uh, of these rather lively discussions. So our mission, uh, we create connections to sustain vital open science infrastructure. I think that the very important thing is that SCOS is there to create these connections. So we connect different stakeholders so that they can talk to each other and so that they can, first of all, create these meaningful connections that lead to pledging for open science infrastructure, but also to sustain this conversation um, going farther. So not just within the pledging, the SCOS pledging round, but also going, going farther. In terms of vision, uh, so what we envision is a world where research is supported by a sustainable and thriving ecosystem of open science, and science infrastructure. I think that here it's, um, we really wanted to focus on um, on creating, on, on supporting um, this open science infrastructure ecosystem, which is sustainable and thriving. This is very important for us. So this is how um, all of this research that John, uh, that John uh, conducted uh, translated into um, two small sentences, but I hope very, very meaningful sentences. Thanks, Agatha. So um, now that we've seen the mission and the vision and we've talked about the, the, the takeaways from our surveys and focus groups, um, it's really important right now to talk about how does this translate into the strategy document. And I was wondering if Jean-Francois can talk to us about some of our high level activities or strategic goals moving forward. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think that the, the work that John has done and the survey and all the answers that we had uh, was in a way comforting uh, the core activities uh, that uh, SCOS has been doing since 2017. And uh, this was translated in three strategic goals uh, that summarize uh, yes, the, the, these core activities. And the first one is uh, promoting sustainability through funding. And I think that here, uh, both words are very important, sustainability and funding. Uh, if we think of SCOS as uh, only uh, a funding mechanisms, we, we only see a part uh, of, the, of the goal. Uh, and uh, sustainability is always uh, in sight for the mid and the long term. And uh, when infrastructures are applying for a, a SCOS, uh, expression of interest, uh, we, we ask them, uh, what is your long term strategy? How do you intend to, to be sustainable after the end of this cost funding? So uh, in this respect, uh, the fact that we create connections uh, between libraries, for instance, research funders, infrastructure is, is a very important aspect, because through connections, then we can create some kind of community. And this is very important for the sustainability of uh, infrastructure. The second goal is, is uh, as important as the first one, raising awareness, uh, because we, we um, as John said, um, we, we can use research infrastructures without knowing them, knowing it, uh, and without knowing that these infrastructures can be uh, sometimes fragile economically, financially, that they need uh, support, they need funding. 
And uh, even I am a librarian, uh, so I, I discovered uh, through SCOS that some very well-known infrastructures have, uh, uh, yeah, have very important needs and need the community to be here to, to back them up in order for them to, to thrive and to be sustainable. So I think raising awareness is a very important goal as well. And the third one is uh, maintaining th trust in open science infrastructure, building and maintaining trust by uh, vetting and selecting. And this is mainly also the, the, the role of the advisory board that Martin mentioned, uh, where the different uh, uh, applications are evaluated against uh, a set of criteria, uh, among them the uh, principles of open uh, scholarly infrastructures. And I think that uh, this uh, high quality uh, uh, yes, goal that we, we, are, uh, we have decided to maintain is also very important uh, to, to maintain trust uh, in, in the infrastructures that are selected by SCOS. Thank you, Jean-Francois. And then how does this translate to some of the, so we've got the goals. These are the, yeah. uh, uh, let's say, the higher goals. How do these uh, translate into activities over the next uh, three years? Yeah, I will leave the floor to Agata for this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, right. Jean-Francois. Um, OK, so based on these three strategic goals that uh, Jean-Francois just commented on, um, we came up with some high-level activities. You can see that there are seven main uh, high activity, um, high-level activities. So, um, and they go together with the goals that we have. So first of all, we would like to make sure that it's easy to, um, to interact with SCOS. So what we mean by that, uh, we would like to manage the application and decision-making process so that it's easy uh, and so that uh, both um, the, the, the applicants and also finally the supported, supported infrastructures, the chosen infrastructures, um, can do it in an efficient way. So uh, we have done many, we, we've already done some adjustments there. So uh, we want to identify ways to make the annual application process more efficient. Um, first of all, also tra transparent uh, and understandable to all stakeholders. Um, so we are very much invested in, in this vetting process and the fact that it should be transparent um, and um, very much, uh, very much uh, uh, approachable for for all of the stakeholders. The third high level activity has to do, to do with communications and and marketing. Um, so, uh, how to make applications decisions on supported infrastructure and fundraising uh, progress. Um, so, this is also something where we very much are invested into um, the presence of SCOS and making SCOS visible. Uh, through the to the to the open science community, and of course that means uh, that we take part into into some um, important conferences that we talk about SCOS, that we talk about infrastructures that we support. Uh, but it's also about SCOS preparing events on its own and uh, um, inviting the community, as we did today, to discuss um, to discuss what it is that we're doing. Um, we would very much also like to focus on facilitating communication. It's again about making these connections. So communication and learning between infrastructure providers and experts and also other industry stakeholders. And then um, very important, uh, important thing from my perspective is how do we maintain this active participation? So SCOS is operating already, but how we to make sure that we are actually, we keep the momentum going. And uh, in order to keep the momentum going, we also want to expand, of course. So we will be seeking new partnerships, new community members from uh, regions that are currently perhaps uh, less well represented in SCOS. Looking for the unmute button, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Agatha. So um, I want to focus right now on our global, let's say our, glo our goal to be global, our global nature. And, you know, one of the SCOS goal is to have, uh, to represent different infrastructure worldwide, but also to have global support for these infrastructures. And I was wondering um, if you can tell us um, and other panelists, uh, if you can tell us how does this support look like right now? And where, and um, whether like the say markets or countries or regions that can do more. 
to support open uh, science infrastructure through SCOS. Uh, thank you. So I might jump in for that one um, as well. Um, um, I think as our group in SCOS being global in terms of representation on the board and the advisory board as well. Um, when we release the expression of interest, we have a full intention uh, that that goes globally um, and the members who are also on the board and advisory committee help in the promotion and marketing of that. Um, we're really looking for a diversity of kinds of infrastructure um, which will respond to the EOI, um, also from the regions of the world that they come from, the languages, for example, uh, which are represented in their research information. Um, and then when um, we then do the vetting of the EOIs and we call um, um, on a fewer number of those infrastructure to provide a full application, um, the application form is designed to really prompt the infrastructure to really think in a critical way um, um, about their service, their infrastructure, the sustainability issues that they're having, and what really would they use the money for and how much money they need. So we work with them uh, to develop a development plan, um, which actually becomes part of the agreement between SCOS um, and also uh, the infrastructure. Um, and then once we've selected the infrastructure that we want to support in the round, um, we do a promotion globally uh, to infrastructure all around the world. Um, and there are hundreds also of institutions which have pledged to date um, from all areas um, of the world. So. We really try uh, to keep the global perspective, um, I think, in each stage um, of the cycle. Maybe I can uh, um, add to that, Martin. Um, so I think, um, so yeah, the, the board uh, is, is doing a lot and, and so are um, many organizations across the world, but it's still uh, necessary to plug away at this because it's still in its infancy. Um, we have some forerunners and we're very uh, grateful to, to them, um, but it's not a standard um, item on the agenda of uh, library budgets, for example. So um, to, to get this out there, we need to have more of those conversations. We need to have those events. Um, we are um, going to have some more um, targeted events so global events, uh, talking about interoperability, talking about sustainability, different uh, business models going forward, which we haven't done in the past. So I think that's also a way how we can bring the globe together to discuss um, open science infrastructure, uh, to gain trust in them, and also to encourage uh, the funding of infrastructure. Um, and also, I, it's really not to be underestimated how important consortia um, are um, going forward. So we've been very great, grateful to ICOLC um, to uh, put SCOS on the agenda um, regularly. Usually once a year we, we appear there. So we want to talk to the larger consortia. And why consortia are so important is we want to keep the overheads down for the infrastructure. So the, the the, the funding is transferred between the pledger, so ideally a consortia representing a number of uh, libraries and the infrastructure. Um, and um, so, uh, and we have seen a number of uh, uh, um, consortia pledging. Something that's been really exciting, which does take time, is that we've also seen um, as a result of SCOS that we've seen uh, countries like Canada or Switzerland uh, putting this now as a standard uh, item on their agenda where they turn to SCOS and they say, can you tell us which are the infrastructures that you're promoting this year? We will um, propose these to our members. Uh, we've even, uh, I had an email from uh, uh, the, the, the Swiss Universities Consortium, where several universities have already been asking, when, when is the next call coming? What, what is SCOS promoting? Because we want to pledge. Uh, so that's really exciting news. Um, I know this is, you know, that's not many countries, but this is already huge because this has just developed in the last couple of years. And if we could try to get at least some 
uh, libraries and consortia I, I, ideally to get that as a standing item, not necessarily only SCOS because SCOS is not the silver bullet, right? But to pledge for open science infrastructure. I think that's really something that uh, we wish for. Um, and then the last point, I think, on this one. Um, so which regions are contributing? Um, we, we, we do see a lot of generosity from certain regions, um, but not all. And if we think that this is an open science, um, uh, it, it's, it's a service uh, to the whole of the research community, open science. And many, um, if you look at the usage statistics of many of these um, uh, services and infrastructures that we, we, we are supporting, it is a global audience. So if you are using it and for free, if you just pay slightly, uh, uh, pay a way forward, less than the cost of an APC, that will do wonders. And we're, we're not yet seeing that from across the globe, but it is growing. And we hope that as people come out of Corona, that they will also think about this going forward. And yes, maybe some thoughts uh, about this question also, Al Walid. Um, I think that uh, there is a, a goal to, to grow, that the support uh, for open science infrastructure grows uh, read geographically with a global footprint. I would say uh, horizontally, but it could also grow vertically. Uh, by that, I mean that uh, in, for the moment, uh, most of the uh, funders are research performing organizations like universities, uh, university li li uh, librarian uh, consortia, just as uh, Vanessa mentioned. But it, it would be also, uh, for me, uh, very relevant if uh, nationwide structures, I mean by that research funders or governments could also step in and uh, include uh, research uh, infrastructures funding in their policies. Um, this is what we are trying to make at our level in France, uh, working both with the uh, consortium, uh, uh, university consortium uh, uh, Couperin, and at the uh, ministry level. So uh, we have these both lines of uh, funding uh, that are uh, uh, used at the moment. And I think that if uh, within the attendees, there are people from countries where uh, discussions are going on about open science policy at the national level, it would be very good uh, to, uh, yes, to make the suggestions to, to add uh, open science infrastructure funding within these policies. And so that governments and research funders include these aspects in their policies uh, for national infrastructures. This is all right, but also for international ones, uh, like the ones we have, uh, we support through SCOS. Can I maybe just add to that, that although I was uh, pushing for the library consortia and uh, today, um, we are going forward in the next years, more actively reaching out to those national or regional governments and funders. So that is also on our list of very important things to do going forward. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Jean-Francois. Yes, so there's a lot to do, and um, and I think we uh, we look forward to connecting with different stakeholders as we move forward to uh, implement and uh, take action on the strategy. Um, so I, for myself, was very excited when the strategy was announced and finalized, and um, and I have a question right now. That now that we have a new strategy in place, we know what our um, goals are what our high level activities will be um, for the next three years. Um, I have a question about the vetting process. Now, SCOS, what makes it unique is about the kind of the, the selective, uh, the selection process. And I was wondering, um, now that we have a strategy, are there any expected changes to this vetting process that we have? And maybe Martin, if you'd like, uh, if you're able to answer this okay. question. Yeah, so that's one for me, um, as well as the next slide. Please. Um, so now that we um, have got information and data from the communities, um, we really wanted uh, to craft the future of SCOS, which is based on that evidence that we've got from communities. So um, when we have just done an EOI process, uh, it's just gone out um, yesterday, which is the start of round number uh, four. Um, and that goes to infrastructure uh, to submit an EOI. Um, in the past, um, 
we didn't really have the data to use to frame the priorities, um, I think around the vetting process. But now that we have the consultation data, we have that for this round. So we're going to really, um, I think uh, we're gonna aim the priorities around the top three um, on this graph, uh, which were already discussed by John. So we're really going to prioritize uh, those three kinds of infrastructure, but we're not going to limit the applications to them um, for this round. So as, as always, we will see, um, you know, uh, what we get, um, I think in terms of EOIs as well, um, it, it will give us, I think it's sort of like a more targeted approach uh, to uh, the vetting that we've got. Um, of course, we can't stand still. So that means that in subsequent years, for example, rounds five and six, um, we may look, um, I think, at different rows in the priority. Uh, but for this year, we're going to be looking at open publishing tools, uh, also at fair open access repositories, um, and also also infra uh, and also infrastructure, which is supporting research data. Um, so, but what it also allows us to do is over the years, um, we'll be able uh, to map, I think the EOIs that we've received against these infrastructure types. Um, we'll also uh, be able to, um, I think also map, I think uh, the distribution of infrastructure across those types, which we support. Um, and that's really all part of the diversity that we're trying to support. Um, also from a global perspective, we can map that too. Thanks, Martin. Um, before I go to the next question, um, I would like to ask the audience, if you have any questions, because we'll be going to the question and answer section soon, please um, add them to the chat. Um, otherwise, you can always um, you know, uh, unmute and talk. So my last question, we've, we've, we spoke about the strategy. We know about what our goals are, what our high level activities. We talked about what <clears throat> we hope that the community can do for open infrastructure. Um, my question is to Agatha, and it's about kind of communication. Now that we're moving forward, how do the, what do you think, I mean, the question is, what can the community expect for us from events and uh, communication? One of our goals is to raise awareness, raise awareness about costs. So um, is there anything that planned for the next couple of weeks, months, uh, you can, that you can tell us about, or that they can look forward to? Yes, thank you, Aloli. There is a lot to look forward to, actually. We have quite a lot in our pipeline. So I think that, first of all, I, I would like to talk a little bit more about this global approach that, um, that we discussed here. So uh, for the first quarter of 2022, we will have a series of webinars that will be focused on the third round, so on the SCOS third pledging round with the free infrastructures that we have there. So Archive, Redelic, Amelica, and DSpace. Um, what we have observed is that um, the, our potential pledgers, they, they like to know um, infrastructures that they pledge to, pledge to a little bit better, and they like to uh, hear from them about their sustainability problems, but also about, for example, their, their governance structures and um, they, their usage. So who, is, who it is that is using these, uh, these um, infrastructures. So um, we will have uh, several webinars and now for the little things perhaps, which are not that little, not to be underestimated, so we planned um, at least three or perhaps even four of these webinars, and they will be held in time zones that are doable for different parts of the world. So there will be one which will be accessible for the North America, Latin America. There will be another one uh, where, um, um, where Australia and also Asia would be able to join. Um, so uh, when we talk about global events and global approach, we also need to take these these things, uh, very, very logistical, logistical things as time zones into consideration. So big series of webinars are coming up in the first quarter of 2022. So this is something to definitely look forward to uh, with uh, representatives of all free infrastructures from the third round there to talk to the community, to answer your questions and uh, to discuss how, how we all can help. Thanks, Agatha. I mean, so I think this was quite informative. Um, I would like to thank the panelists for their input. And perhaps right now we could uh, 
listen to the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, um, just please go ahead and unmute and uh, ask away. Uh, I'll give you some time to think about it. <laughs> Everybody's shy. So, I mean, I mean, that's the sign that maybe everything went well. Um, well, I do have a question. Um, and, and I guess uh, uh, giving time to the, uh, the audience to think about the questions. And you can always, as I mentioned, put them in the chat that we could ask uh, the panelists. Um, it's a general question about, I mean, I think it's for the panelists, a general question about open science in general. Besides paying, you know, besides funding open infrastructure, what can, um, what, what other challenges that can be, um, what other challenges that need to be addressed when it comes to open science? And it's just uh, if, if somebody from the panel would like to take that. Maybe I can just, uh, linking it to the funding, um, and I think uh, Agatha also just um, touched on that point. Um, governance, good governance is so, uh, so critical because um, pledges, funders, libraries, not just libraries, uh, also research funders, governments, they uh, uh, trust is, is extremely important uh, nowadays. And uh, knowing that the community is uh, well represented, that they, um, they can have some influence if they are pledging, for example, uh, that they can have some influence in the development of some of those infrastructures going forward. So how, uh, what are the relations like between the community and those uh, infrastructures? Uh, what do they also understand about the market? How do they compare to their competitors? So we ask also in the application process, mm -hmm. you need to tell us about your value um, to very specific target groups, and we ask them to explain that, but also how do they uh, compare to, to others? Um, and, and I think um, for open science and, and trust in open science, um, good governance and uh, community governance um, and good engagement with the community that you're serving, I think is really important uh, going forward. I will leave, maybe if I could, maybe something that I think is, it's not tangential, but it's an additional point, which is an observation from working with the uh, SCOFs and all of the members and the active members is the openness that the organization has to the fact it is not trying to preach a one-size-fits-all solution. SCOS is by its very definition something that was created to make change and has focused on doing something, delivering funding, being an active um, organization, but very deliberately on a small administrative staff and a small budget so it's it's set out to achieve change on a particular model and in a particular way and it's been successful and so working on this strategy unlike some others was very much about helping the organization think through what's been successful what what could be improved what could be made more effective and i would encourage everyone to read the strategy obviously i would having helped write it but it but it is quite thoughtful in the way it positions scos as an entity that doesn't have the right answer for everybody doesn't claim that its process fits every organization perfectly, doesn't claim that um, everyone should do things the SCOS way, and, and is very active in looking to work with other parties and supportive of other solutions that will help support open science infrastructure. And I think this is something that where um, dialogue in the sector there's, there's, I, I, I'm reminded, and I've mentioned it to him, and he's on the call, but Rob Johnson wrote a piece with the uh, Science Communication Institute on Scholarly Kitchen, probably not 
expected to mention about um, a common approach to open and the need for diversity of solutions and openness to people trying to achieve the same goals. And I think that's something that's really important within SCOS, which is SCOS is not trying to dictate one way. It is trying to encourage people and help people find capacity and solutions that work for them. And so that the talk of diversity and the need for global, um, you know, to be global is as much about finding people who have innovative ways to solve problems and can and have new ideas that will serve the community really well as, as much as it is that that's just a good thing in and of itself. So I, I think that's an observation that aligned to your, your point. It's not just about funding. It's also about finding creative and, and different solutions and working across different with different groups and being open to that in and of itself. And I think that's something that's really refreshing about the SCOS team. You know, they're very, it's very clear that the administrate it's administratively light, it's nimble, it's active, very pragmatic rather than being um, dogmatic about the right approach. And I think that's something that it's been really important to preserve in the strategy for the next three years. And the first time SCOS has a strategy is not to lose that element of what's been really successful about SCOS. Thanks, John. And thanks, Vanessa, also for uh, sharing the links. So, uh, yeah, as John said, we invite everybody, please, to read the, the strategy. Um, and I wanted to also um, jump in and just talk about trust. Um, and it's around the vetting process as well. Um, you know, I think um, we really have tried I think to demonstrate the value of open infrastructure and the importance of it and just raise awareness that you know we're not asking for large amounts of money and in fact um, with the work plans the infrastructure are running quite lean and that the and that the process is all very outcome uh, focused so it makes a real difference to real infrastructure uh, which researchers use all the time. But the vetting process around it too is really about trust. Um, you know, we've tried um, to use experts uh, to do the vetting process um, and the evaluation. There's also an annual review as well with the you know, with each of the infrastructure. Um, with there, we talk to them um, um, about the work they're doing, the progress against the work plan, and that they're spending the money on what people think that we're going to be spending on to improve the sustainability and the infrastructure as well. So, you know, we've provided a pathway um, where pledging institutions can provide relatively small amounts of money. It's about the cost of an article processing charge um, to help improve this infrastructure without themselves having, uh, you know, like to survey all the infrastructure possibilities out there and where to put their money. So um, we hope that that will make it easy uh, for pledging institutions. Uh, first of all, to decide to pledge to open infrastructure, and then also to decide which infrastructure that they want to support. Thanks, Martin. Um, so we do have a question from the audience, um, or two questions. The first question, um, is do you know, for example, from focus groups interviews, whether initiatives that have whether initiatives, <clears throat> sorry, that have applied but were not selected have been able to use um, their application process to find funding support elsewhere. Um, so the idea also, what other alternatives are, are there? Um, perhaps maybe John, if you would be able to answer this question? Sure, I mean, and I'm not sure I can answer the question directly in, in, in and of saying um, whether applicants have been able to reuse the application the application process somewhere else. But what I can say is that there is value to organizations in going through the application process because by doing it, they are, they are encouraged to define things about their governance or articulate the way they spend money and the way that their finances work in a way that they may have not done before. And that they express that that is a good process for them to have gone through and it stands them in good stead when they are then going on to apply for funding elsewhere. So certainly the materials and the work that they do in uh, making an application to SCOS are of value to the organization in how they govern themselves, how they manage the organization, and that they have reused those materials in other places. Thanks, Can John. I, 
Can I maybe add to, uh, to that? So uh, uh, thank you, Bianca, for your question. I can't exactly answer it either. And I think it's a great question for us to, to, to maybe find out more about, but I do know, and we do encourage those who aren't successful the first time around, we do encourage them to apply again and several have succeeded. So also going through the first application process, and if you go through the full application process, you get uh, uh, some feedback, but you know, understanding what we require, what we ask for. Um, uh, second time around, two or three have actually then succeeded um, by tightening up perhaps some of their um, procedures, arguments, uh, looking at some of those things more carefully. So uh, it's helped them get through the discuss process, but I'm not, not sure about uh, with, with others. Thanks, Vanessa, uh, for answering that question. Now we, had, we do have a second question. Um, and I'm not sure if I uh, understand the question correctly, so I might ask the, the, the asked to maybe clarify. The question is, do you know what to what extent selected infrastructures from earlier years have been able to retain financial support after this cost supported period? And perhaps maybe Vanessa, if you could answer yeah. that one. So I can do you want me to elaborate or? <laughs> oh, if you like, Bianca. Yeah, well, I don't know, perhaps it's yes, great. But it was, yeah, but mostly whether, uh, whether this cost funding is seen also by the, the recipients as a one-time funding or also as a, as a sort of startup uh, leading to more sustainable funding and whether organizations who pledge funding do that also, uh, do you, whether you have any evidence of whether they do that also for a longer period than the one year. Uh, yeah, we do. Period. So that's a really great and important question. And, and I think Martin also uh, touched on that. So we're, we're starting to build some of those relationships. Um, and we actually encourage not just one year funding, but three years of funding. But what happens that's after true. those three years, right? So after the three years, we do have evidence that DOAJ, um, for example, uh, that they are continuing with some of the, so they already had a number of pledges, they didn't need SCOS for that, but those significantly increased through the SCOS campaign. And some of those, uh, I don't have the numbers, but I know that a number of those are continuing, perhaps at a lower rate, uh, but they are now partnering with DOAJ and also have the opportunity to serve on their governance. So that's a really uh, great uh, development. That's those are the relationships we'd like to build. That they that the pledges have confidence. It's not just a one-time thing and then go away, um, but that they have confidence in that service. That they understand the service better, um, and that they um, build that relationship going forward and um, continue to to pledge. And I think that there are similar voices with DOAB who recently reached their target, which we're thrilled about. Um, so this is kind of the start of a conversation um, about pledging and building with the community uh, your uh, infrastructure going forward. Yeah, that's great to hear. Thanks a lot. Thank I you, if, I can, if I can add to that, actually. Yes, um, because uh, Vanessa, you you mentioned DOAB in the context of uh, in the context of um, you know sustaining the support beyond the, the fact that they the, the, the fact that they already reached their target. And I had the pleasure to talk to Neil Stern, um, who's uh, who's the director of DOAB and OAPEN um, on that very topic. Because uh, you know, and we had uh, we had a short interview. I will drop the link uh, in a second so you can you can have a look at it. Where yes, of course, at, uh, on one side we were celebrating the fact that they reached their target, but at the same time, uh, I think that the most important uh, message here is that this is not the end. That the, the, an even more important question here is how to sustain it, how to make sure that these connections don't just go away just because they reach their target. Because of course, their future is not only about reaching one target. They they need this um, this stream of support which is constant. So yeah, just, uh, and I will drop the link to the interview because it was a good one. Thank you, Agatha. 
Um, yes, so sustainability is a journey, right? So, and we're happy to be part of it. Um, we do have a, another question, um, and it's about uh, vetting and selection. And it's from Ed from Crossref. Uh, thank you, Ed, for your uh, question. And the question is, um, let's say to the panelists, with respect to the criteria for funding, um, is there tension between urgency of the need of funding and organizational resilience? And I'll I jump in. Um, I, think, I think the answer there is yes. Um, We've only got so much amount of resource because we're very lightweight. Um, most of the people are volunteers. Um, so we decided quite early on that we would scope to try to support a round three infrastructure in each round. Um, and some rounds the EOI has bought, I think a lot more EOI responses than that. Um, we also um, in our scope decided quite early uh, to focus on established infrastructure, which has been running for two years. And they do need to demonstrate that they have a sustainability issue as well. So I guess that plays into resilience as well. Um, but as well, we're also looking um, for an application which meets the criteria and the broad range of things that we've put into the application form. And we really do want the organizations are to engage with the application process because that's um, you know that's how we can apply a process and a vetting process uh, which has a transparency to it which is important yeah but once we do support an infrastructure um, also over three years um, they can have funding come in for each of the three years and so SCOS will work to market their campaign but we also encourage them to build also their own capacity for marketing as well can i maybe can i maybe just yeah. add to what martin uh, just said I think what's also really exciting is to see that some of these infrastructures are growing as organizations. So professionalizing, bringing those engagement uh, experts, marketing people. I've seen that in DOAB. I've seen it uh, at Open Citations. And um, it's, you know, they, they can do so much more now. And that's also um, largely thanks to the pledges coming from the community. Um, and um, so that, that will also hold them in much uh, greater stead going forward. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I think we have a question. Uh, Walid, I have a question, if I, if I may. And it's a question that I've been actually dying to, to ask through this process okay. <laughs> of us preparing the strategy. And I've never had a chance to ask you, I just realized. So um, it's a question perhaps to John, but maybe also to other board members. So during this process of preparing strategy, preparing a cost strategy, but also running these interviews and focus groups, what was the what was the most surprising outcome of it? What was the most uh, most something that you really didn't expect to discover during during this process? Thank you, Agatha, for that question. That's, uh... <laughs> Hopefully, John can answer that one for you. Um, John, what was the most surprising part of the, the process? Or what was, a, let's say, a surprising uh, finding? What? That's not putting me on the spot at all. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Agatha. You know, we've, talk, we've talked about this webinar for, you know, uh, several hours over the last few weeks. And there she was definitely no the question before, right? <laughs> There's no, no way Agatha could have told me she was going to ask this question in advance. Like, the, the, thing that, the thing that springs to my mind the thing that springs to my mind is the consistency of response from people across the sector who, so, so I talked to a lot of different people in a lot of different positions about SCOS who had different level of knowledge about the uh, way that SCOS operates and, and how much funding it got out and the organization, just differing levels of knowledge. But the one thing that was really consistent and really interesting about those uh, respondents, wherever they came from was that they, they said, look, I think this thing about SCOS could be changed and improved, or, or this is something I don't really know about SCOS. But I really value the fact that it's there and it's doing it. And I think it's, it's really valuable. And I think that we should appreciate the fact that it's 
it was set up and it does it and funds get out and that's really great. And the consistency of understanding about that point across different stakeholders was really interesting and not something that I had expected has come across working for other organizations. So SCOS I think has lots of critical friends, has lots of people with, you know, they would like to see um, a clearer a clearer understanding of what should happen after three years. I think my response to that is, well, SCOS has only been in existence really for properly for three years. So, you know, that's something that will develop over time. You know, lots of questions about whether the mechanism works in exactly, whether the mechanism could work better for organizations of different types. Definitely true that there are ways in which it could be tweaked to work better for different people. But everyone at the same time as those, they are obviously friends of SCOS. They see it, they value it, they want it to succeed, they understand how it's playing a role. Are there aspects about SCOS that they could understand better, that they would like to understand better? Yes, but um, SCOS is, is warmly regarded and has lots of people who um, see it and wish it well. And that's not something that necessarily I would find in similar, working with similar organizations or in different ways. Thank you, John. I hope. Agatha, <laughs> happy with the answer. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I would like to just add a, a point, you know, we're also working uh, um, over the next last months with a strategy working group. Um, what's great is that we started in a position of wanting to know how the community thinks of us, and we've, we've accomplished that in, the, in a sense that what's really great is that we know right now that our, our, say our mission, our goals from the beginning was to help sustain open science. And it's really great. I mean, maybe it's not as I mean, like surprising in Agatha's <laughs> terms, but what's great is that it reaffirms what we're doing and it encourages us to do more uh, moving forward. And um, yeah, we are looking forward to connecting with more uh, infrastructure, with more funders and more users going forward now. Um, I don't see more questions. So I was wondering if there's anything for, that the panelists would like to add um, as last remarks before we go on to the next section. Um, if, if not, then I would like to thank you all, uh, the panelists, and uh, Martin, Vanessa, uh, Jean-Francois, John, and Agatha. And we have, a, um, um, Agatha will now speak to us about the, the third round. And Agatha, um, please go ahead. Your floor is yours. Thank you very much, Al Walid. And um, yes, I will give you a short, actually a short teaser of uh, what we have in the third round of SCOS. Uh, and again, if you have questions about it, please, please make sure to put them in chat. I will be happy to, to take questions uh, after the presentation. So let me just try to share my screen here now with you. And hopefully it's going to work. Can you see my screen now? Great. Uh, yes. All right. So I would like to talk to you about the third funding cycle that we uh, launched uh, actually not that long ago uh, because we launched it in September. And we have three infrastructures in, in this round. So um, we have some of them are perhaps better known and some of them not that well known yet. And I would like to stress the word yet here. So we have archive, we have Redelic America together uh, as the second as the second infrastructure, and then we have DSpace. So what I would like to do in this uh, very short presentation here is to tell you a little bit more about um, each of these um, of these services, and also show you uh, what what is their pledging target. Um, and how they would like um, how, how they would like you uh, as potential pledgers to, to engage with them. So archive, I don't think that archive needs a lot of introduction, to be honest. Uh, uh, if you are a researcher, I think that you you've been uh, you've been using archive at least once in your in your lifetime. So it's an open platform to share and discover emerging science. Um, archive um, by now um, is um, more than thirty years old. So they have around 2 million scholarly articles in eight subjects on their platform. And um, their services include, a variety, there is a variety of services that they uh, propose to the community. So uh, there is article submission, there is compilation, there is production, there is retrieval, search and discovery, web distribution, 
API distribution, content curation, and preservation. And these are only some of the services that Archive offers, um, offers to the research community. Um, in our round, uh, we are representing, representing Archive here, and Archive is actually asking the community for the following donations level, uh, their pledging target, and it's an operational funding for two years in the case of Archive. Is, so the pledging target is set at seven, um, 7,010, more than 7,010, uh, 710,000, sorry, euro. Uh, euro. Um, uh, if you would like to pledge um, to any of these infrastructures, the best way would be to contact them directly. We have a contact person for each of the infrastructures here. You can see you can see them at the bottom of the screen. Um, however, if you would like, of course, if you would like some more general general information, or if you would like um, to contact us uh, about uh, about some additional um, information about the third round, please do not hesitate and also contact me. Um, next, uh, next in line for the third uh, for the third pledging cycle, we have Amelika and Redolik. So um, this is um, this is one of these uh, of these infrastructures which is perhaps um, not that well known, especially for the for the uh, for the audience in the in the north. So um, Redolik is an open uh, open journal uh, index. And uh, they are very well known in Latin America. They serve the community. Uh, and sorry, because I, this is not what I wanted to do. There we go. So uh, it's a, again. So it's an open infrastructure that advances diamond open access publishing. And Redalic, uh, at the moment, they have uh, almost 1,500 open access peer reviewed journals on their platform, published by almost 700 institutions coming from a plethora of countries. Uh, Amelica, on the other hand, uh, and this, these both infrastructures come as a package in the third round, as I mentioned. So Amelica uh, is a, this community-driven in initiative, which is supported by UNESCO and led by Redelic and Claxo. So Amelica, um, their main goal is to foster collaboration among different st stakeholders. So they connect universities, journal editors, libraries, and the research community and they promote uh, diamond open access publishing. Um, here, is, uh, here is the pledging target for Redalic and Amelica. This is uh, an operational funding for three years in that case. And as you can see, um, they, are, um, they are asking for uh, over a million euro. You can see different donation levels that you can, you can choose from. And again, uh, talk to them directly or please come to me and I will be uh, happy to, to start the conversation. Um, last infrastructure in this round is DSpace. I think that also perhaps well known to some of you uh, as this is uh, one of the most widely adopted open source repository software in the world. So at, at the moment, uh, they have more than 3,000 academic libraries who are using uh, this, um, this software. And this space is free to download, very easy to install, and you can customize it uh, depending on your organization's need, needs. Uh, and again, more than 3,000 academic libraries are using it. Um, coming back to what I think Jean-Francois said, sometimes we don't realize that we are using a certain infrastructure. So these infrastructures are sometimes invisible in the mind of, of researchers or, or, li or libraries or, or research funders, but they do exist. And just because they are free and easy and easy to operate, it doesn't mean that they do not need our financial support. Um, so this is the pledging target for this space. Um, in this case, we are also looking into operational funding for two years and the pledging target is set at 663,000 uh, euro. As you can see, again, you can choose from different levels of, of uh, pledges that you, can, <clears throat> that you can offer to them. And again, please do make sure to contact them directly or to contact me in case you would like to pledge for them. Um, on each of the slides for each infrastructure, so you could see that there are also certain discounts that are uh, offered to, um, to consortia. So this is also something to, to look into and to um, talk to the, the infrastructures about. 
Um, so the third round is open and all of these infrastructures are very ready for your, for your uh, pledges. So um, please um, either contact them or contact us. And as I mentioned um, earlier, we will also have um, a series of webinars with all these free infrastructures in which they will tell you a little bit more uh, about what it is that, that they want to use the money for, what are their sustainability issues, where it is that the community can step in and help them. Um, they will also talk about your governance structures and they will also show you how widely they are used, which perhaps not all of us are aware of. So I would like to very, very warmly invite you to, to come to these, uh, to these webinars at the beginning. We will start at the beginning of 2022. That's it from me about the third round. Are there any questions? Just checking in the chat. Not yet. Okay. I hope that there will be more questions coming to, to the infrastructures themselves um, during, during our, web, our, our upcoming webinars. Um, are there any other questions, uh, final remarks, either that the panelists would like to make or uh, coming from the audience? It's the last call before we all part. So the time is now. Okay. I don't see I don't see any questions. So I think that we can we can park here. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you for all the nice uh, the kind messages in the chat. That's great that you learned a lot. That was uh, that was our goal. Uh, thank you uh, to the community again. Um, thank you for coming to the webinar, but also thank you for taking part in the consultation, because if it weren't for you, we would never be able to come up with uh, with our strategy for the next three years. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye.